you maker. I call you maker. You give life an eternal spark. I call you healer. And you mend any broken part. I call you faithful father. Cause you finish everything you start. My soul was made.
There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king alive had given up his life The darkest day in history There on the cross they made for sinners For every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake together all hail Creation suddenly, our 
those who are serving us as ushers to start passing the buckets. And as they're doing that, I just want to draw our attention to a lyric in that song that we just sang, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. And an altar is a place where something is sacrificed. It's a place where something is sacrificed and given as an act of worship to God. So as we give tonight, let's magnify Jesus Christ from the altar of our lives as a church. God, we thank you. Father, we thank you for the gift that you gave. We thank you for Jesus Christ. God, I ask that we give 
out of the generosity of our hearts as an act of worship. God, continue to move, continue to touch our hearts and move in and through us tonight. Lord, we praise you. Before Jesus was crucified, he gathered together with his disciples for a meal. It was his last supper. And at this meal, he wanted them to know a few things. He wanted them to know that he was about to walk into a time of incredible suffering that would end in his death. But he wanted them to know that this moment in his life was going to change everything. He told them at this meal that he was actually going to give his body and shed his blood But in doing so, he was going to make possible a brand new relationship between people and God. That on the cross, Jesus was going to open the door for people to be able to come back to their heavenly father. He called this new relationship a new covenant. And a covenant is really just a promise between two people that defines their relationship. And at this meal that he shared with his disciples... He invited them to do something from that moment on. He told them that whenever you come together, remember me. He actually gave them a simple but special way that they could remember him when they come together. At this meal, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Whenever you come together and eat this, remember me. And then at that meal, he took the cup and he gave it to them to drink. And he said, whenever you come together and you drink this cup, remember me. Remember my death. Remember my sacrifice. Remember my suffering. And to this day, we as a church still come together and we have moments where we take bread and we eat it and we remember him. We take juice and we drink it and we remember Jesus. And we call this communion. And at Pathway, we practice open communion. And that means if you're a believer in Jesus, we invite you to receive communion with us. We hope that you got the elements when you came in today. They're kind of packaged together. The bread's on top and you can see the juice down in there. And in a moment, we're gonna receive those together. But before we do that, our worship team is going to play a song over us in this place. There are moments when we sing together, but there are other moments when sometimes we just need to be sung over. And over the next few moments, we want to invite you to let our team just sing over you. We want to ask you to take the elements that you're holding, and as the team is playing, for you to just enter into your own moment of remembering Jesus. For you to take the, you know, the little package, and you see the bread in there, and you see the juice in there, and for you to remember that your father in heaven, that he saw everything in your life. And he not only still loved you, but he came to this earth to pay the penalty for all our sin, to on the cross, take it away, to establish between you and him a new promise, a new relationship, a new covenant, that whenever you come to him, whenever you by faith approach him, Whenever you call on the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. You are loved. You have hope. That's what the cross teaches us. 
That's what Jesus' suffering accomplished for us. And over these next few moments, would you take some time and remember him? Just pray to him, talk to him. Maybe there needs to be a time of confession over these next few moments. Just acknowledging that you still need his forgiveness. And you know what? It's there for you. His love is unfailing for you. And he wants to meet with you right here in this place. And so let's let our team just play over us. Let's have some time to remember Jesus. And then after this song is played, I'll come back and we'll receive the elements together. The perfect Son of God in all his innocence. You're walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is, he's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, a son of suffering, blood and tears. There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the son of down in merciful
There's a God who weeps There's a God who bleeds Oh, praise the one Who will reach for me It's hallelujah To the Son of suffering Hallelujah To the Son of suffering Hallelujah Son of suffering. So if you would, just peel that top layer off and grab that little piece of bread. Father in heaven, we hold this in our hands and we're reminded together as a church that you gave your body, Jesus, that you came and you suffered and you endured the cross. And so as we eat this together, we remember you and your love for us. Let's eat the bread together. And Father, in this moment, we are reminded of the incredible cost of the cross, of the price that was paid, of your blood that was shed, Jesus, that on the cross, you brought us forgiveness, that on the cross, you displayed your love. And God, we're so thankful that you never give up on us that there is nothing that you wouldn't endure for us. God, we're thankful that you sent Jesus. And Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood, pouring yourself out for the forgiveness of sin, to make a new promise, to create a new way. And right now as your church, we take this juice and we drink it and we remember you. Let's drink the juice together. Father, it's your uh, son, his body, his blood, that's real food and real drink, that nourishes our soul, that raises us up, that gives us new hope and life, and we celebrate you. King Jesus, you are worthy of all our praise, and we love you, and today we recommit, we turn back, and we look forward to the life that you're laying out for us. And so God, teach us, encourage us, strengthen us right now. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Praise God. Well, we're gonna jump in to God's word and to a time of teaching. And over the next few moments, Pastor Ron is gonna take us into a new series called Beneath the Surface. Let's check it out. Evening, everybody. With a guy with ADD, this is a problem tonight. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I am, you know, just trying to figure out where do I go and what happens. And uh, But uh, let's give the team a great hand. And this is just a great setup for this evening. So it's really good. Yeah. So we're going to walk into an eight-week series here. And we're going to walk through a series really talking about how do we connect our spiritual life with our emotional life. And uh, I think this is going to really be transforming for a lot of us. I know that for me it will be. A number of years ago, I actually came across a book by, uh, by Peter Cazero, which was Emotionally Healthy Church. And a number, no, long time ago, and I read the book, and, 
and uh, really, really helped me to understand a little bit more about the fact that, yeah, churches, churches have, need to be healthy, not only, not only spiritually, but certainly even emotionally. And, uh, and then this year, someone else handed me a new book, another book of his called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. He has one called Emotionally Healthy Relationships. And after a while, they begin to sound a little bit like a Manilow album. You know how it starts, they all sound in the same thing. For those of you who know who Manilow is. Uh, and, uh, but this is really a good book. It's a, it's a book that really helps us to understand the fact that, yeah, there's so much that's connected between what goes on in our lives spiritually and also what goes on in our lives emotionally. And the truth is, is that for Scazzaro, uh, when he was dealing with the Emotionally Healthy Church, uh, he was producing a great work. They were growing a great church. A lot of good things were happening, but there was a lot of things missing in his life internally. And actually, when I read that book, and as I've been working through this book, this is going to be a hard study for me. This is going to be a challenging study for me. I think it's going to be a challenging study for a lot of us as well, because Many times, I know that for me, uh, within ministry, you can get so caught up in doing the ministry, in doing the good, that you miss sight of the good that God wants to do in you. And uh, that's happened in my life, and I'm sure that's happened in many of your lives as well. And, and it's just easy to get off kilter. Sometimes it's easy to feel a little messy uh, emotionally when we're still trying to grow in this relationship with we have to, with, that we have with the Lord, certainly spiritually. And, uh, and so I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands tonight, but because I, I know that this is an emotionally healthy bunch of people. You know, I know that to be the case. And so I'm assuming that none of you were, have any, any, any concerns with worry. None of you have any levels of anxiety. Now, I would go on to say that I'm sure that no one here battles with any anger or frustration or fear or disappointment or discouragement or maybe a challenge from your past, or something from your upbringing, or personal regret, or unforgiveness, or lust, or pride, or cynicism, or any sinful tendencies, because the fact is that we know, we know for Pathway, we are a church of spiritual giants, and, uh, and we have it all together on the outside, and even more so on the inside. Anybody want to applaud that tonight? And, oh yeah, so you are? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot, I think we've got some work to do, is what we have to do. So here's how we're going to work through this. As we walk through this series, there's some various ways that we're going to really encourage you to walk through it. One is, Brad, kind of that outline that's there. Yeah, that right there. That's great. So when you came in this evening, you get an outline, and we're kind of changing it up for this series. And so in the series, uh, there's just a few things we're going to ask you to do. One is to listen to the weekend message, really three things. Listen to the weekend message. Do your God time. Inside the bulletin this weekend, and, or the outline, you'll see that we've actually We've actually expanded the God types, and we want you to go through this at a little slower pace, because pace is really everything as it relates to growth. Uh, there's some good questions to consider. There's a prayer that we've included in this that we just encourage you to etch out time each day to actually spend time going through the God time. And then if you're in a life group, when you're in that life group, they're going to actually be talking about the message that, we've, that we're kind of dealing with this weekend. And so your life group this next week is going to deal specifically with what we're talking about right here. The other way you can go is if you want to, you can actually buy the book. And, uh, and inside the outline, inside your outline, again, there's actually a section there are resources. And I'm going to give you resources every week, uh, things that have been important to me as I'm walking through the series and some of the other guys as well as they're teaching. Uh, Scazzaro's book, this week, we're kind of on chapter one and kind of looking at that. And, uh, and then there's another really great book that I've been working through lately, which is The Deeply Formed Life by Rich Valadas. And then a book years ago that actually I did in my, when I was doing my grad work was a small little book um, by David Siemens called Healing for Damaged Emotions. And it's a rich book. It's, it's a classic full of really great content and uh, would really be helpful for a lot of us to walk through. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of tie it a little bit into what we're talking about as well. And so this weekend, we're going to talk about what it means to actually uh, kind of deal with this issue of something that is desperately wrong. Um, I don't know, do any of you have any family pictures on your wall? And when you look at those family pictures, there's a story behind it. This picture looks great, but there was a lot of fighting that went on to get the picture taken. Uh, when when we, our kids were growing up, there were some of those moments, you know, just hold still for a moment. And, uh, and so the picture looks great, but you know that behind the picture, there's a big story that was going on along the way. Or, or maybe you've encountered people, people who look good, but then when you get up close to them, you realize it's not so good, and things aren't quite what they seem to be. Uh, I don't know if you're following the story of Elizabeth Holmes. 
Uh, but recently, Elizabeth Holmes, who was just really kind of indicted as well as found guilty on, on uh, some really serious fraud charges, um, she was actually labeled as the next Steve Jobs, Inc. Magazine did. And Elizabeth Holmes in 2003 formed a little company called Theronis. And, and actually in 2014, her net worth became $9 billion. Theronis was a company in which she was, she was working on this, understanding this idea and creating, they had created the system whereby instead of taking a whole vial of blood from someone, they could just kind of prick a finger and with a little bit of blood, they had the equipment to run that blood and to find out everything that was wrong with you. She sold the deal and investors bought into the deal. So much so, billions and billions of dollars went into this deal. Walgreens signed on the line. We're gonna make this happen within, the, within all of our stores. But none of it happened because it didn't exist. It didn't exist. Matter of fact, in, 24, in 20, 2015, Forbes put her as, uh, as net worth of $9 billion. In 2015, Forbes had her at $0. And for Elizabeth, it looked great on the outside, but inside the company and inside Liz, things were crumbling. Things were crumbling. So when we think about our lives spiritually, one way that we can really look at it, spiritually as well as internally, is that many times we can find ourselves living like Liz. It's kind of like the iceberg. And that is that, that many times when you think about the iceberg, you see the iceberg and you see what's on top, but only about 10% is what's on top. But the iceberg is much bigger, 90% underneath. And we have a tendency to live with the 10%, to live with the projections of maybe who we are, what we want others to think we are. And, and yet there's a lot underneath that makes up who we are. Our family backgrounds, our brokenness, times of regret, fears, um, crisis within our life, attitudes. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff actually underneath that, that God is very concerned about. We tend to live in a culture that it's all about the image that is projected. But the fact is, is that, that God is really not concerned about the outer world. He's concerned deeply about your inner world, about what's going on inside of you. Remember that, that moment in, in Samuel when uh, King Saul is made king and suddenly Saul's pride gets in the way and God decides he's not king anymore. And so he sends Samuel to Jesse's house, who's got all these sons and Jesse's looking for the tall, dark and handsome one. And God says to Samuel, that's not who I'm looking for. That's not who I'm looking for. Matter of fact, he says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, that the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his, on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him for the Lord does not see as mortal see. They look at the outward appearance, but the Lord, he looks at the heart. And so God is very much concerned about what's going on inside of us. And I need to tell you something. It doesn't stop with age. Age doesn't matter because he's gonna work it out in us for an entire lifetime. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? So here's the big idea for you this evening. Write this down and then we're gonna jump into really the text here as well. And that is that God didn't create you to compartmentalize your emotional health from your spiritual health. You know, the truth is, is that we're all created differently. Man is created different than woman, all created differently but we're also created very differently than anything else in all creation. And so when it comes to the reality of how you're created as a human being, really the first thing you need to understand as you talk about this issue of emotional, healthy spirituality is that you've got to have respect and you've got to respect your full humanity. Uh, Genesis 1.27 says that God created mankind in his own image and in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created him, created them. He's, we are different than any other aspect in creation. As human beings, uh, we, are, we are formed within the image of God. And so therefore, our makeup looks a little bit different. Let me, kind of, let me give you a little wheel illustration here that I think speaks well to it, is that we're social beings, we're intellectual beings, uh, we're spiritual beings, obviously physical beings, but we're also, we're also emotional beings. And that is that God created you in his image and he created all of us with emotions. God has emotions and we have emotions. And, uh, and we feel things, and, and we encounter things. And I know that some of you would say, well, my dog has emotions. I get that. You know, my dog's 15 years old now. She's blind. 
and, uh, and a little bit blind, and she can still make her way out of the door, and I have to help her get down on the, off the deck now, and, and uh, because she's that old, which means she's really old, a lot of things aren't functioning like they used to function, and sometimes she does things that she shouldn't be doing in the house. And what's interesting is, is that when she does that, she hides. It's like she's got this emotion attached to her, but... You know, she's an emotional being, but it's not the same thing as it is with the rest of it. Everything, everything is connected to the inside of our lives. And the fact is that our emotional life matters to God, and then, then it matters to others as well. So how do we get in touch with this? We begin to walk through the series that I think is going to be transformational for us. How do we do this? Let me give you just a second thought here as we walk into tonight. And that is that you need to make space for the Holy Spirit to go beneath the surface of your lives to transform you. You have to make space. And, and space, I'll talk about at the end, is, is about pace as well. It's about having the space to do that. And I think the best one in, in, in Scripture, the best illustration I can give you in Scripture is the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, who certainly... Uh, was a uh, was was before he was a Christ follower. He was that one that was out conducting the assaults to take Christians out. And then Jesus shows up to the Apostle Paul, and uh, and he sees the risen Savior, and he has this radical conversion within his life. And Paul begins a journey of God using Paul's life to impact the world. And actually, we're a result of Paul's impact upon the world, and actually the starting of so many churches. But Paul Paul was a very honest guy. He was very honest about his journey with the Lord. He was very honest even about his emotions and what he was going through and what he went through as a Christ follower. And a lot of times, I think sometimes we, we read Scripture and we miss sight of the emotional connectedness that actually is there with, with the writers of Scripture, with those that, that uh, were, were giving of their lives and certainly giving us instruction. But they were human beings like every one of us, and Paul was one of those as well. And, and so, a matter of fact, Paul even talks about this transformation that needs to take place in our lives through the, through the presence of the Spirit in Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, of your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Our mind what we think, how we act, how we respond, what we feel. Our, as one writer put it so well, our minds are never neutral. They're always being shaped. They're always being conformed. The question is, what are they being conformed to? Who is shaping them? What is shaping them? How are they being shaped? And, and really, the fact is that for many of us within our culture, it's the culture that's shaping us. It's the world that we're allowing to shape us. It's the opinions that are being presented to us. It's the agendas that are being projected towards us. And for many, that is the shaping that takes place. And, and, and here's what I want us to understand as it relates to this issue of transformation. And that is that we are, not, we are not transformed. When it comes to our relationship with Christ, we're not to be transformed from the outside in, but really from the inside out. From the inside out. Rich Veladas in, in The Deeply Formed Life says, we are, con- we are covertly and consistently being formed by a culture Fashioned by shallowness. In short, we are being shallowly formed. And culture, culture forms us really outwardly from the outside in. But the Holy Spirit, Paul talks about the fact that when we receive Christ in our life, Romans 8, the Spirit of God takes residence in our life. And when the Spirit of God takes residence in our life, he begins to shape us. He begins to form us. We begin to find ourselves dealing with new convictions. We begin to find ourselves at times wrestling with things that are outward because of how that feels to us, what we sense that's doing to us. And and we begin to realize, I've got to start thinking differently. And as a result of thinking differently, it's going to cause me, it's beginning to cause me to live differently. I'm different now because of that transformation. And, and, And the truth is, is that what is happening within it's going to eventually make its way out, make its way out of your lives. I mean, when the Spirit of God is really transforming us internally, it's going to make its way out in our emotions. It's going to make its way out as it relates to our to our relationships and even towards our decisions. A few weeks ago, um, one of my one of my kids was walking through a really really difficult difficult season, 
And, uh, and there was a lot of anxiety and there was a lot of worry that was going on. And, and we were together alone for a few days. And, and, uh, and so one morning I was out on, I was just kind of went out on a run and I was thinking about this and, you know, you know, when I get to run in the morning, I mean, that's my time alone. And I don't like to run with anybody else. It's just me <laughs> and my mind kicks in. And, and on this run, I was just processing all this anxiety and processing all of this worry and just this weight that, that was being carried. And, and so when I got back home, when I got back to the place where we were staying, I just kind of sat down with her and I said, hey, let's talk about this situation. I really think there's some things we need to talk about here. She said, all right. I said, so you got, you got a couple options that you're being faced with here that you have to make a decision about. So I'm just really kind of sensing what I want you to do is I want, to, I want us to write down what are the positives for option A and what are the positives for option B. And so we started writing a couple and she just kind of stopped. She said, well, I just need to tell you that I've got more negatives than positives. I went, oh, okay. Well, then give me your negatives. So she gives me her, gives me her negatives, gives you all the negatives. I said, okay, let me give you some positives. <laughs> Here's the positive I see. So I give her the positives. So we got this list. We got this list of positives. We got this long list of negatives. You know, and those negatives are controlling the emotions. Those negatives are controlling the anxiety. Those negatives are controlling the worry. And I said, okay, so you're carrying all this and you're trying to figure this out. Yeah. I said, okay. So let me ask you this. Just one thing for you. So at the bottom, I just wrote God. I said, where is he in this? Where is he in this? Because, you know, that's really the key is that you're trying to do this all on your own, but where, where's the Lord in this? Where are, you, are you giving this over to him? Are you, are you including him in this, in this moment? And that was a moment of an aha for her, and it was a moment of an aha for me. And that we have a tendency, we have a tendency to allow those emotions to drive our decisions rather than to step back and say, wait a minute here. Who's the one that I need to include in this decision? It's God. And as a result of it, she was actually able to make a really good decision. So, so here's, here's the thing I want us to see, and then we're gonna move really fast. That is the Holy Spirit, he really uses the outside though to really transform what's going on inside. I mean, again, think about just the various ventures. I just want us to think about this just the, the, the encounters that Paul is having. In 2 Corinthians, if there's ever a book that you need to read, it's the book of 2 Corinthians. It's probably one of the most complicated books that Paul writes, or letters that Paul writes, but it's a letter in which we begin to see Paul working out, kind of working out his relationship with this church, but also working out his relationship with the Lord in the midst of some very difficult, difficult, challenging times. And he expresses what God is doing in him, what the Spirit is doing in him, through these hard moments. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. Just listen to a little bit of what he tells this church in Corinth. He says, I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. He said, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger from my in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've been hunger, I've known hunger and thirst, and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. I mean, think Paul had some hard days. He's kind of expressing, this is what I've been through. <clears throat> you would think he'd be willing just to kind of give up. And actually, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he talks about the fact, he actually, he actually brings to the fact that, that he despaired of life itself at one moment. This is the Apostle Paul, wrestling through hard stuff within his life. He goes on, look at 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10, and then 16 through 18. Here's his on the screen. He says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. This is kind of perspective 
that Paul's giving in the midst of all that he's been through, all that's happened outwardly, <clears throat> and then what's taking place inwardly. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. He said, for our light and momentary troubles. Now I'm thinking that what I just read a few moments ago was not light and momentary. It was pretty hefty stuff. And yet Paul's looking at that and he's saying, listen, I know that all this is momentary. I know that I'll get through this. I know that we, we can get through this. It's a momentary issue right now is what this is. And he says, momentary troubles are achieving, but they're achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen outwardly, but what is unseen internally, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen of where he's getting me ready to go, I know that's, in, that's eternal. What we see in Paul is this, that Paul was completely honest in his troubles, his emotions concerning them, and where his hope ultimately was placed. And he knew who he was by the grace of God and authentically embraced his identity. Matter of fact, he even goes on to say that it's the grace of God because of who I am and what I am. It's because of what he's done in me and what he's, done, what he's doing through me. And this, this embrace allowed him to develop emotional stability throughout his post-conversion life. Matter of fact, to the people, to the church in Philippi, he wrote, wrote these words, verses, uh, chapter four, verses 10 through 13. He said, I've learned <clears throat> to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. <clears throat> I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. The core issue of this verse is one of contentment in all circumstances. And Paul confessed that it was something he had to learn. How many of you are content in all your circumstances? I'm not. And yet Paul's saying, I'm trying to gain a perspective here in the midst of what I'm going through. Can you imagine I can't even begin to fathom all of the weight that Paul could have felt on his shoulders. And uh, as a matter of fact, when you think about even the psychological stress that he was faced with, and yet we see Paul kind of step, stepping back and saying, you know what? I'm able to be satisfied in God. And that's the key, regardless of my circumstance. Because <coughs> Zero says it this way. He said the strength that he received from Christ was not the strength to change, deny, or defy your circumstances. It was the strength to be content in the midst of them and to surrender to God's loving will for him. God was Paul's peace <clears throat> in the midst of his personal chaos. And because of his emotional health, he had this solid foundation from which he could build upon. And so... Really, what you do, then how Paul responds really flows out of what was going on in him and what goes on in you as well. So here's the last that I want to give, give to you, and then we're done. <clears throat> I was working up in the attic today <clears throat> and uh, with blown insulation, and I was afraid this was going to happen. And actually, the buddy I was working with say, was saying to me, I hope that when you get up to speak tonight, <clears throat> you know, so it's happened. But I am content in every circumstance. And so are you. You're going to hear me hack through this thing. Uh, but I'm done, almost. Transformation, here it is. Here's the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the good news tonight. And that is that transformation is going to take a lifetime. And I think it's going to take a lifetime of some hard Holy Spirit work in all of our lives. Cazero gives, gives really 10, 10 symptoms of emotionally unhealthy uh, um, spirituality. And I'm not going to have you, I'm not going to give it to you. It's something you can pick up this week. But the truth is this, and that is that the transforming work the Spirit of God wants to do inside of us is something that just doesn't stop at some point. And it just didn't happen at some point. It goes on for a lifetime even up to the point of death. 
Romans 8, 26 says, the spirit helps us in our weakness or in our infirmities or in our emotions. And, and what, I, what I love about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit knows you so well, knows you inside and out, and he knows exactly the areas in your life that need to be dealt with and need to be refined and need to be reshaped no matter who you are and no matter what stage of life you find yourself in. And that happens in good seasons and it happens in, in challenging seasons, but he knows, he knows how to fix our hearts and he certainly knows how to fix our emotions. There's a story, a story of Henry Ford and back when he had, uh, you know, obviously had his plant going and, and all the engineers put together these generators, but there was one particular engineer by the name of Charlie Steinmetz that actually was the creator for, for the key, in, the key, the key uh, uh, generators that ran the plant. And one day, one of them went down and the plant shut down. And so Ford invited, you know, some of the crew around the plant to try to fix this thing and nobody could fix it. So he called Charlie. And Charlie was this short little guy and... Uh, you know, but he was the creator of the, of the generator, so he would obviously know what needed to be fixed. And Charlie came in, and he said they came in, and he went to that generator, and he tinkered around with it for a little bit. And, uh, and as, as he tinkered around for a little bit, didn't take very long, uh, he got that generator going, and, and he left. And, uh, and it wasn't long before um, Ford received a bill from Steinmetz, and the, the bill was for $10,000. And uh, so he wrote, he wrote Charlie back. Obviously, he didn't have the ability to text Charlie back, but uh, he wrote Charlie back. And he said, hey, Charlie, isn't this bill just a little high for a few hours of tinkering around on those motors? And Steinmetz returned the bill to Ford, and this time it read, for tinkering around on the motors, $10. For knowing where to tinker, $9,990. Total $10,000. Henry Ford paid the bill. The Holy Spirit knows where to tinker. And so how do you do it? How, how's this gonna work in your life? Let me just give you, and I don't have four of these on the screen, but little kind of four Ps I thought of this week. One is pace. Make sure that you're edging out time to do what we said with God regarding the God times and just take some time. Spend time in the word each day. Pace. Having time. Having time. The next is Pray. You know, making certain that you are um, having some time to, if you don't know how to pray or don't know what to pray, well, we've, we've put the prayer in there for you. So we're, we're making it easy on you, you know, pray. And, and then just simply be present. Allow, find a way in which you can just allow the spirit of the Lord just to speak to you. And that's done by being present. That's done through pace, that's done through prayer, that's just done through presence. And most of all, invite some people to come in around you. It's important that you don't go alone. Uh, many years ago, um, when Laura was alive, uh, we went up to, to uh, Northern California and we got to see the redwoods in Northern California. They're magnificent, amazing if you've never seen them before massive trees and you see them and uh and you would think that the roots on the redwoods would be, go like down hundreds of feet but actually they only go about six or eight feet down and what makes them what makes the the redwood able to grow and able to stay strong is the fact that their their roots are interconnected with other redwoods and so when the storms come they hold tight and they hold tight to each other and uh and they're able to continue to grow actually those roots grow deep inside the redwood going up but they're connected to others around them and we all need connectedness to others can't do it alone can't do it alone you need others to walk with you you need others to be present with you you need others to speak into your life no matter the age no matter where you're at. And for some of you, because for some of you, when you think about 
just this issue of emotional, healthy spirituality and just emotional health, spiritual health. Some of you are going through some really, really difficult, challenging things, and you really do need some help in maneuvering your way through this. Um, right after I moved to Fort Wayne, I took on a, a little, took on a job at Fellowship Church on the southeast side of town, and um, and I uh, started doing youth ministry there. And we just kind of started this thing, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And uh, I can remember, I'll never forget it. I remember we were walking the kids through uh, just a series on really emotional health is what we're walking through. And I remember one day sitting in my office, and um, I was going through a list on inner pain. And I'm walking through this list, getting ready to do this teaching, and all at once, all this emotion came over me, and I realized, I got a lot of stuff in here. I got a lot of stuff. I didn't know what to do with it. We'll talk about this in the series. There's a lot of stuff in my upbringing, and my family, and, and my situation, my circumstances, and I said, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> so I picked up the phone and I called a counselor and a professor that I'd had in college. And he had his own, had a hug and shingle and had his own little office. And I remember I called him up and I said, um, I need to talk to somebody. And he said, I can see you tomorrow morning at 6.30. <laughs> I'll be there. 6.30. That began a 30-year relationship with that guy. It still exists to this day. We all need wisdom to be spoken into our lives, especially as it relates to this issue of understanding there are things in our lives that hold us back, that affect us, and that God has put great wisdom around us through his church, through his people, and through very wise counsel as well. Let's stand together, shall we? I'm going to pray. And, uh, I wish we could do this setup every, every week. Uh, last night, Olga led the team in a great, we had just an awesome time of, of uh, worship last night in prayer, and it was, we just left it up for tonight. So I guess, if, I guess we could ask if there's, any, if there's like a group of like 20 people that wanted to commit every week to do this, they could set it up and tear it down, right? So let's pray. Father, thank you for, um, for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity for us to be close together tonight. It's been really sweet to, um, to what I feel speak more intimately into the hearts of those that are sitting in this space. Lord, I know that you've got a lot of work to do in my life. Um, you're doing work in my life. And uh, it's good. It's good. And I know, Lord, you've got a lot of work you want to do in the lives of those that are in this space. Help us to be courageous. Help us not to be afraid. Help us, Lord, to, to realize that you really do have the best in mind for us. And that through the presence of your spirit in our lives, that you gently change and transform us. You know us so well. And so, Lord, I pray that as we walk through these next eight weeks and as we really deal with this from a, a true discipleship perspective, that, Lord, you would just change us, change our marriages and change our relationships and change our hearts and our lives. And that maybe at the end of this series, we might actually look a little bit more like you. Things would just be different. Especially as we walk through this world where there's all of this stuff coming at us and it's stirring our emotions each and every day. Lord, help us to, to anchor ourselves in the truth of who you are and the truth of how much you love us and you care for us and what you want to do and what you want to do in and through us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. I said, there's, there'll be some folks down front love to pray with you if you want some prayer. If you're here as a guest, stop by guest services on the way out. If you're looking for next steps, stop by next steps as it relates to how to connect more deeply at Pathway. 
We'll see you later. Have a great week, everybody.